Live from the Business Radio X studio in Atlanta, it's time for Dental Business Radio. Brought to you by Practice Quotient. Practice Quotient bridges the gap between the provider and payer communities. Now here's your host, Patrick O'Rourke. Hi there, friends of the dental business community. This is your host, Patrick O'Rourke, on today's edition of Dental Business Radio. First of all, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsor, Practice Quotient, PPO Analysis and Negotiation. If you're a top tier provider, that means dentist, oral surgeon, periodontist, endodontist, etc. And you don't feel that you are being paid or compensated adequately or fairly per your top tier status by your contractual allowables on your fee schedules, i.e. insurance companies that are your business partners, then you may you should call the fine folks at Practice Quotient, headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, national have clients from Anchorage to LA to Miami to New York. Um also they have a article right now if you contact them and ask for it and mention dental business radio. They will give you top 10 things to think about or top 10 tips to know prior to negotiating your PPOs. I uh, just mentioned dental business radio, top 10 tips. All right. So with that, thank you to our sponsor. I'd also like to give a big thanks to our guests who came in all the way from Kansas city, Lois Banta. How are you, Lois? I'm great. I couldn't be happier to be here. All right. Well, we're thrilled to have you here. And we're really just kind of a continuation of our our conversation that we were doing before. Um, Also with us, as always, is the Monsignor John Ray Esquire. First of his name, last of his kind. Um, So he'll be here as well, although he doesn't say much. Um, He's over there chewing some tobacco right now. (laughs) Um, So um, we'll let him be as long as the soundboard's working. So, Um, so, you know, welcome to Atlanta. I know that you were here recently. I was. I was here recently to have our 25th anniversary for our Speaking Consulting Network conference at Chateau Elan. It was great. Chateau Elan is a mm-hmm. very fine property. So fun fact, on a personal level, that is where I proposed to my wife. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we love that property. It's my third visit to Chateau Elan. Really? Yeah. So shout out to Chateau Elan in Brazelton. Brazelton? Brazelton. I called it Brazelton. Right. Well, neither one of us are actually born Tomato, in tomato. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, we got the chateau part down, yeah. so that's what's important. Um, so you were over there, uh, 25th anniversary of the Speaking Consulting Network. So tell me, I'm very interested um, in the Speaking Consulting Network. So describe the uh, genesis or the origin of the organization and how it's evolved So the Speaking Consulting Network was founded by an international consultant speaker, Linda Miles, back in Mm -hmm. 1996. And uh, she was being approached by several people in the industry to teach them what she knows about the profession of speaking, consulting, and writing. And she thought, hey, I think that might be a company. So she invited uh, the first meeting she had, I believe it was in Florida. She had 11 people. Mm -hmm. And... um, I joined that organization one year later after its inception, uh, and there were 14 of us. And now we have members upwards of 500, which we've grown organically and very slowly. So the essence of the Speaking Consulting Network is it's an organization, a network of entrepreneurs that are either beginning uh, fine-tuning or changing their ownership of their business. They're an entrepreneur in the speaking, consulting, and or writing world. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the Speaking Consulting Network, when I joined, I was still working full-time in a dental practice. Mm-hmm. But I but I had the thought that I wanted to teach people what I know. And my boss's dental buddies were having me in their offices to teach their teams how to get the results I was getting. So I thought, mm, I think that's a company. So I joined the organization two years later. I quit my job and uh, jumped full time into speaking, consulting, and writing. In 2010, Linda Miles uh, was slowing down and she decided uh, she wanted to semi retire. So I bought the speaking consulting network in 2010. And so now uh, we've grown the organization to be more about um, keeping that network of colleagues and entrepreneurs. Uh, checked in for the entire year. So we organized a a new member day where you can come in and learn the trade secrets that I have established over my career. 
And then we have two additional days of a general session. We have guest speakers outside the dental industry. Speaking Consulting Network was formed in dental, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't limit itself to the dental industry. It's entrepreneurs who are growing a successful business. Mm -hmm. Uh, It started in dentistry because that's where Linda Miles was. And that's, so that's where most of us land is in the world of dentistry. From there, we grew it to a monthly uh, live mastermind type session where we, have a think tank for an hour and it's our members sharing information about how to grow their successful business every single month. And then three, uh, four years ago now uh, we started an SCN unplugged at the request of our members someplace mid year that we could get together and really share ideas of how we could grow or maintain our successful businesses. So we call it SCN unplugged and that's in Napa Valley. Really? Is there acoustic guitars? (laughs) No, but that's a great idea. We did have a great band at our 25th anniversary. Mm-hmm. It was rocking. Yeah. And did you do any singing there? I did do a little singing. Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh I just knew you were going to ask me that. Yes. Um, two of my uh, consulting colleagues and I uh, rewrote the lyrics to Mamma Mia, and we performed a little ditty on uh, surviving COVID in the consulting, speaking, and writing profession. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so John Ray's never heard of Mamma Mia, um, except for the pizza joint that's outside Lithonia. Um, c- could you uh, give him a little sample? Oh, you're terrible. You're just rotten, rotten to the core. Oh, you Let's can do see. it. You're um, a superstar. Uh, I have to remember because, you know, we the lyrics were on a little TV. So let's see. S-E-N, here we go again. My, my, oh, how much we've missed you. S-E-N, here we go again, my, my, how can we resist you? Back when the COVID started, we were all broken hearted. S-E-N, here we go again. Love it. There you go. Nice job. Now cool. everybody knows I'm a singer. I know. Well, now Thanks I, a lot. All right. Well, now you have a new career niche. Like, <laughs> it's all about options. Yeah. Uh, look at John okay. Ray. He's, yeah, he if this, if this consulting design. thing doesn't work out, I, yeah. Well, you know, the thing about consultants is that, um, you know, you, you, some people think that they want help, right? But then they really don't. And then they don't do it. And then they blame you. Um, you know, singing or performing, like if I had my druthers, if I had any talent at all, uh, that's probably the direction I'd go. Uh, the only thing I'm good at is wh- what I do. I, it's what I tell people all the time. But I th- thought I was going to play the guitar as well. <laughs> well when I was a kid, I was going to be a rock star. Um, but I, I don't have any talent like you. Oh, yeah, yeah, not like that. There's so, that. Yeah. yeah. It turns out you need that. Kind of do. Yeah. yeah. Or, <laughs> or you need to be like really well connected or super attractive, neither of which I don't check those boxes. Well, that, that singing thing has really worked out for me as a speaker because I've never lost my voice. I'm a trained I'm a trained singer so you lose you use those techniques to be able to um keep your energy up and not lose your voice that's interesting and so you especially like flying around because you're you're going all over the place all over yeah. and as far away as indonesia and australia wow god bless you i've never <laughs> been over there um so it's it one of the things that's kind of perked my interest is i speak i talk about my stuff right which i can talk about at any point in time and it still <clears throat> puzzles my wife to, she's like, people pay you thousands of dollars to get up and talk about that insurance stuff. And I'm like, yeah. yeah. And and she's like, here's 10 bucks. Would you shut up, please? <laughs> you know? And it, but I don't know how it started. I just like to educate and help people. And there's not too many folks out there who know what they're talking about in, in this particular topic. And I found other Thought leaders, right? Not not named Lois, but other ones that claim to be, you know, very knowledgeable about this particular about my subject. And I'm like, nah, that's not exactly. Um, um, what's a polite word? Shenanigans. Um, uh, let's just say that's not 100 percent accurate. And so it's I like to help educate, but my topic of insurance, especially to the people that are come docs and practice managers, um, let's just say their attention span is limited. I'm always impressed that there's, you know, a hundred people show up to, to listen. Um, now I, I try to make it as entertaining and I use as many analogies as possible. Um, but explaining PPOs, EPOs, uh, and the credentialing process to folks. Oh man. You know, sometimes I feel like my, I'm up there and then my, I slip into Portuguese. Like, did I slip into Portuguese in mid sentence? <laughs> Why are your eyes all glazed over? Um, and so how the folks find me though for it 
and, and I have no idea. I've never promoted it. It's not really a profit vehicle. I just do it. Um, it's part of, I guess, call it the education is part of the mission of practice quotient, you know? And so that I feel like we're in the good guy business. If we just go help people understand the environment, you don't have to hire us, but right. Understand knowledge it. is a powerful tool. Right. And so that's what we do. So, um, I was really, I was fascinated with the, um, with the idea that there's actually some speakers that get together and then they know a lot more than I do. And so I was like, that sounds good. And I told John Ray to get us over there at the Chateau Alain and he's slipping as usual. I don't know <laughs> what he was doing that day. He was probably at the dog track or something, but we could have played <laughs> golf and got a massage at Chateau Alain, oh, yeah. you know? Um, so John, you know, John Ray Monsignor, I love him. I do, but sometimes, um, Sometimes. So at any rate, that's what really kind of piqued my interest. And then we have a mutual friend in common, Teresa Duncan. Shout out to Teresa Duncan. You know, we got love for you. And tons she, of love for Teresa Duncan. Yeah. Love her. And she's like, You gotta talk to Lois. And I said, Okay, well, we'll bring her on the show. And I'm like, Well, Lois probably doesn't know much about me and I don't know much about her, and that's okay. Yeah. Um so you've had an interest so we have speaking consulting network. What would do you think like name some what what when you think about it and you, it makes you smile, I'll use, I'll appropriate something you told me earlier. Yeah. What are the three things that make you happiest about Speaking Consulting Network? Oh, only three. Okay. Oh, you can name more if you want. Um, Speaking Consulting Network is, it's the organization that prevented my profession from being a lonely profession. So you make a lot of friends um, that are out there doing the same thing that you're doing. We share a lot of ideas. I refer business to my SEN colleagues, because I don't want to be the expert in all areas. And so speaking consulting network is where I learned that you don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be a lonely business and you can be around really smart people that don't know the things that you know, and that know things that you don't know that I can then refer to. So I love the organization. We check the ego at the door. So there's a, it's not another organization like it in the industry that I'm aware of where you can go, you can, um, you can share ideas with each other and nobody's going to take your idea and say it was their own idea. We always give credit to everyone else. Uh, we've launched so many careers at the speaking consulting network. We have meeting planners that come looking to hire speakers, consulting organizations. If you don't want to be the lonely uh, single entrepreneur out there, we have consulting organizations looking to hire consultants for their companies. We have dental journals from all across the United States and Canada and Australia looking to hire um, authors for the articles. We have podcasters uh, that looking to interview or be interviewed. So it's just a, it's become an organization of like-minded professionals that want to grow or start their own speaking consulting business. Mm -hmm. So I, I I love it. We're love not for it. everybody, by the way. Oh, nothing is. Some right. people come once and don't come back because they want to make it all about them. And, and SCN isn't that. It, SCN is a, is truly a networking organization where it's all about each other. Right. See, that sounds very awesome and welcoming for me personally because it is lonely when you're an entrepreneur. And you're going, you're the one who's making all the decisions, right? Everything runs through you. You're the butcher, you're the baker, you're the candlestick maker, yes. you're the HR person, you're the website guy. Everything has to be decided. And so all of that gets tiring after a while. And so it's nice to be, go into a situation where there's no pressure on you and you're actually able to learn from other folks. Yeah. And as some somebody, and it sounds like these consultants are all experts in their own Yes. Realm, right? So yes. an image expert, mm -hmm. right? Or Janice Hurley, image expert. Judy K. Mozoff, expert on culture and helping uh, teams and dental practices get along so that they can get out of their own way and grow a successful business. Dr. Roy Shelburne, who is a colleague of both mine and Teresa, who talks about how to not make the mistakes in documentation and narratives that send you to jail. So mm -hmm. we have a I've wide array of... Um, so many experts in the industry. Inspired Hygiene, Rachel Wall. She built a successful hygiene consulting business. Hygiene's not in my wheelhouse. So when I know someone who needs coaching in that arena, I call Rachel. See, I think that's genius because that's where I also struggle. And one of the reasons with the show, and I have these conversations I was explaining to you earlier, like why did I, you know, I have these conversations with folks all the time because I'm like, 
uh, you know, people ask me, I'm like, listen, I've never ran a dental practice. <laughs> like this used to happen. All I'm like, listen, we, you just made a hundred thousand dollars. All right. Um, right. don't go buy a boat, put, invest some money back into your practice. And they're like, how do I do that? I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> I've yeah. never ran a dental right. practice click. Yeah. Um, but usually I would send them back to the person that referred them to me, but it, I would get questions all like, I, I don't know anything mm-hmm. about hygiene. We were like, what's a good hygiene consultant? I have no idea. Right? right. And so to have a place that's, um, professionals that are all in the good guy business, that's kind of a, thing of mine i know it sounds a little corny but it's what i believe that are trying to help people and also you know help each other and i don't have to be an expert in hygiene i just need to know who the expert is right exactly and And, and i think that's what what scn has done for the consulting profession is we haven't made it all about being a quote quote consultant we've made it about really helping the dental profession improve their bottom line improve their well-being, and we know people who can help them with that in addition to who they've hired. Mm -hmm. And so I love it. I do. Um, And then Janice, is she um, doing – she an expert on cone beams and panoramic (laughs) x-rays? No. Janice is an image expert on how you present yourself, whether it's your professional appearance, whether it's your Zoom broadcast to make sure that you can impact in the most professional way. She'll go into offices. I've had her go into offices and completely make over, so to speak, a whole entire team. And their productivity went up and tripled because of how the perception – Image is all about perception, how mm-hmm. someone perceives you to be an expert. If you're going to show up in torn up jeans and a ponytail, you're probably not going to be taken very seriously if you're in the profession of building a business. <laughs> so she teaches people how to how to get out of their own way in that respect. I've worked with her myself. Now, I love um, – I love that professional appearance, but there were things I'm four foot nine and a quarter on a good day with high hair and shoes. So I have to choose my wardrobe a little more carefully than someone who's tall because mm-hmm. it can make me look shorter or smaller or bigger or wider or whatever. She teaches how to appreciate your own persona and make the best out of that. She doesn't change you. She just teaches you how to make, be a better you basically. Mm-hmm. I love it. And so do you think we, if we brought her on the show, do you think that she could help John Ray or is he a total lost cause? I think John's a total package. I, I think that she's going to have to, <laughs> that's very kind of you to say. Uh, I think that she is going to have to bring a whole lot of miracles with her. Um, I think she'd really like your jacket and your shirt with the uh, cufflinks and the uh, initials. She would, she'd be very impressed with that. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Janice. Uh, <laughs> Image Janice, that's not here. We'll <laughs> just pretend that you're here. Um, but we said your name in a lot, enough that I bet you're going to listen to the show. So I'm sure I'll meet I'm you gonna, one day soon. I'm going to have her listen to that show because, uh, I, and I, and more, most importantly, I respect her. She's a good person. She's got great ethics and great integrity. Mm-hmm. I like that. Um, and so not panoramic x rays, but definitely image. Yes. Um, and, that's interesting. I actually would like to to speak with her. So, if listeners, stay tuned. Um, maybe she will grace us with her presence, perhaps with a kind introduction. If we don't make Lois too mad today, <laughs> um, which I don't think we've done yet. Not yet. No. Uh, well, it's not really our goal. Well, you did make me sing, so. Uh, yeah, we enjoyed it. Jury's I out. saw it. Your eyes were <laughs> dancing. You, you loved it. Um, so, uh, so those are the things that make you happy. Um, what do you see as challenges uh, with speaking consulting? In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to share with you something that I have heard that troubles me a little bit. Um, I mean, again, speaking is not my main thing, but it makes me a little sad is, you know, folks are saying, hey, well, you know, conferences are just going away. And I'm like, really? No, they're not. I, I, I'm not sure I buy that. Like, what's the no. deal? Why, why do people say that? People say that because it's the popular thing to say right now. That's my opinion. They they also said, you know, the private practice is going away. No, it's not. It's, it's never going to go away because there's the human element. So speaking live, in-person speaking events are not going to go away because the humans want to see humans speaking. Now, is video conferencing going to increase? Of course, because it's the nature of the beast. But live presentations – that's where people get their learning on, in mm-hmm. my opinion. Now, I've had my second one since COVID live conference, sold out, completely packed, so happy to be there, 
hearing live humans. It was nice. I went to the Georgia Dental Association uh, a couple weeks ago and just to get out and see people again and see some folks I haven't seen in over a year uh, or longer. Uh, it was really, really nice. The human contact, you can't zoom and go to meeting it is better than a phone call, right? Cause you can sort of read body language. Somewhat. That's why I flew here. Yeah. You but know, I, I want a live interaction. I don't want to. It's I don't much better, isn't it? So much more, so much better, so much more impactful. Mm -hmm. And so also all potential guests that uh, come in the, Lois has uh, set the standard, so no more are we doing Zoom. You want to talk on Dental Business Radio, you got to go through John Ray, number one, and Mildred, <laughs> but um, you got to fly in because I also enjoy this. I get more out of it. I think the guests get more out of it. Absolutely. And, and it's a great studio. Better. It is. It's very nice studio. Yes. Thank you very much for Renaissance Bank for uh, letting us in here and John Ray, even though they have not given me any money, even though I've walked through the hall several times. <laughs> and they're like, you got to sign this. I don't want to sign you got a good smile, anything. so there you go. Uh, well, thank you for saying that. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I need uh, more work because my clients were all dentists. They're always looking <laughs> at my teeth and I'm like, eyes up, buddy. Eyes up. <laughs> my hey. eyes are up here. Yeah. Yes. I'm not a piece of meat. <laughs> Come on, man. Man. Um, so we don't, you don't see that as a challenge. I think that I, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, I also, the other boogeyman that's been around for a while well, is uh, old corporate dentistry, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, listen, all right. Is it there? Has it been there? Yeah, it has been. Is it going to take over the world? Probably not. Right. So no. it, it doesn't really matter because you can't do anything about it anyway. No a business owner to business owner. Just do you right? right. Be the best you that you can be. Surround yourself with the best people. Right. Hire. Right? So like, I'm really good at what I do, but I'm not an attorney. So I have to have the best attorney. Right. right exactly. I, I have to have the best IT people. I need the, I, that's how I hire. I, I don't have to be the smartest person at everything. I just need to go find the smart people and put them on my team. Right. That's right. That's exactly, that's how I do business. I, I'm not a corporate consultant. I am a private dentist consultant, but I know a lot of smart people who, who consult in the corporate industry. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. I'm going to send you there. I'm not going to go. <laughs> <laughs> right um it's interesting because a lot of dso's they call and uh the, i don't know i think they're not used to me uh and uh, you know uh, so i'm not going to kiss your ass no um number one and so and i also i explain i say listen this isn't cotton balls right so in bulk is not good actually for this this is the very difficult more projects and we do have some corporate clients but you have we have to have very very long conversations because you know we're going to be friends for a while hopefully we're friends forever mm -hmm. but what we need to do is we need to understand what are your objectives right do you even know where you're at right now by the way some of this is in the top 10 tips listeners if you want to get it in writing and you're not you're driving right now um so I share the knowledge with everybody, but I need to understand if you don't know where you're at right now, then how do you know where you want to go? Absolutely. I, I just want to make more money. Well, what, what about, you know, now you have, so the larger you, you are, the more money that's on the table, right? The stakes are higher, right? right. It's not right. just short-term money. We're talking about long-term money and we're going up against some folks that are very, very good at this game and they are ready and they have their, their own competitive intelligence units. They have, um, you know, their own training. They're very focused on this. Mm -hmm. They have their own consultants, lawyers, and, and guys like me, right? Right. Just like me. And they're <laughs> sitting over there. And what do they do all day long? They come up with ways to keep their cost of care down. Sure. Absolutely. What, what's the cost of care? That's the providers, right? This doesn't make them bad people, by the way. So I don't bash the insurance companies like somebody, Jordan. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I know who Jordan is. Yeah, I like Jordan. We got I, yeah. I get a huge kick out of him personally. Um and he makes me laugh. And so um and I met him at Christine Taxon's event. So sorry, I digress. Um you know, where am I going with this? The insurance companies have the folks like me that are dedicated to bringing their cost of care down because that's their number one expense. Um when I'm looking at a room full of docs, I go, Hey guys. How focused are you on um, whatever you're paying to your dental supplies, right? It's Henry Shine, mm -hmm. Patterson, like whoever, right? Uh, doesn't matter to me. Uh, those are the big names, right? I, and they're like, oh, well, we're focused. Man. We go from eight percent to seven percent. I'm like, oh, is that good? Seven percent sounds good. I don't know, John Ray, does that sound good? 
John Ray's like, I can't count that high, <laughs> you know? And so don't take off your shoes, man. Come on. <laughs> um, anyway, so I'm like 7%. All right. 7%. That sounds good. I guess. Is that good? I don't know. Um, now everybody close your eyes for a second is what I tell them. And I go, now imagine that instead of 7% of your business, it was 75%. 75% of every dollar you ever took in was paid out to your dental supply company. How focused would you be now? And then there's a little girl in the room, laser focused, Pat, laser focused. <laughs> I'm like, that's you. Yeah. To the insurance industry. All right. And now imagine you're a Fortune 100 company or a Fortune 500 company and you have an army of folks like me and resources to throw at this. That's what you're up against. So the bigger you are and then the faster you're growing. Mm -hmm. Also, people don't understand is that your credentialing is a huge mess right now. It is a big mess. Uh, and so mis is misguided, misunderstood, um, misinformation, which is putting them in legal concerns, in my opinion. I, I could not agree with you more. We could do a whole show on credentialing, but then I would want to jump off a bridge. Yeah. Um, credentialing is awful. We don't do credentialing. Like just saying, you know, it's, it, yeah. we manage it. We try to help, but these are legal documents. These are contracts. You guys need to be aware of what's in them. And there really isn't a, any legal way to skirt around it. No, <laughs> there's, no, there's, there's, not. There, there's not. I get the questions all the time and I, I won't go. And I that's a whole nother show. I did an interview last week and it's like, you know, you can, you can ask me that question 1200 different ways. I'm going to give you the same exact answer. Which question was it? Can I, can I just say that this dentist is working temporarily and then we he could be like a locum tenens dentist. It's like, uh, no, I get that question every yeah, day. No, yeah. no. The locum tenens dentist, they have to be credentialed. Everybody that is in a network has to be legally credentialed. Please stop asking me that question. All right. So right. yeah, it drives me crazy. Credentialing is or peas in a pod. Yeah. Um, and so, but it's the, What's never been associated with the word quick is now an absurdly and comical, abysmally bad issue because of COVID. And it's yes. really, everybody's backed up. There's nothing you can do. Back in the old days, you could, you know, I could walk down the hall and t take the file and take it from one desk and go do that one next. Right. Right. And yeah. you, nowadays across the halls across the sea and or across the ocean. That's and, right. And they're not immune to COVID by the way. And no. so this, and this has all been backed up and then they have to verify your credentials. So they're calling Ohio state or GRU or whoever. And guess what? There's nobody there. And so this has all gotten backed up and backed up and now For it's, sure. and so, and now with there's consolidation. And so, and then you, it's not a good idea in my professional opinion to try to, you can't say on one hand, Hey buddy, I really need high fees. I really, I need these, or I need to get credentialing and fast. Do me a favor. Come on, Lois, Lois at the insurance company. Get this done real fast. I love you so much. I'll send you a Christmas card. Come on, please. And then on right on the other hand, you go, uh, Hey buddy, uh, these fees are terrible. We're not taking this crap. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. No, no. Uh, you know, I, I, I want good things for the dental profession. I want people to play nice in the sandbox, but I also am dedicated to making sure they don't make the mistakes that they got to do it legally. All right. Compliance. There's no it's easy big. way to do the right thing. Right. And an ounce of legal prevention is worth a pound of legal cure. Absolutely. Um, and so it's not worth the risk in my, not worth the risk. Is, in my opinion, right? Nope. That's my background is, yep. is risk management. <laughs> it is not worth the risk. Um, and, and no good professional would ever advise a dentist otherwise. Right. But there's some that they're like, well, I've heard, I heard, I've heard lots of people say that. And I'm like, but wait, where did, who told you that? Yeah. And they're like, I, I read, I read it on Facebook. Right. I'm like, <laughs> well, it was on Facebook. It must be true. Well, what other news do you get off of Facebook? <laughs> is that the gospel? I don't understand. Um, and so I just recently got on Facebook, um, because the marketing people said I needed to. Um, and every now and then I get on and I'm trying to answer some questions for folks, but I feel like I lose three hours of my life every time I do that. And um, you're open up to perception. Perception drives truth until you prove otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, and I've taught that in my business forever. It's like, you cannot, you can't write your company. You can't grow your company based on someone's perception. 
You just have to do the right thing, do your research, and make it legal. All right. Amen. What other challenges do you see as an industry? So if we're looking at the dental industry. So, well, if I'm looking at the industry on this from a speaker's point of view, speakers are severely undercompensated in dentistry. Um, they, they bring a lot of knowledge to the table and COVID has really affected that greatly mm-hmm. um, in the honorarium is being lowered and uh, travel costs not being reimbursed. So for a speaker, I see that in our industry um, that the profession has been affected financially. Uh, as far as in consulting, what I find the biggest challenge in consulting is the dental practices wanting to improve having no idea how, how to run a business because when they went to dental school, they learned how to be a dentist. They didn't learn how to run a business. And so in the consulting profession, um, simple things that can be identified to help them go in the right direction very quickly versus take 12 courses and learn how to um, improve your bottom line. If you don't get to the nitty gritty and the dirt very quickly, you're going to lose the dentist and their interest. Mm-hmm. So that's my my opinion. So when I speak and how that leads to consulting is I point out small things that make a huge difference. Uh, an open hour on the schedule can translate to thousands of dollars in lost productivity. So if you did n- nothing else but less than one opening per day, you're going to increase your production by about $45,000. Those are the kinds of things that when you can cut to the chase and make your point known very quickly and you can impact their bottom line and prove it, that's what's going to make a good consultant. So what's suffering in consulting in our industry is that the knowledge base might not be there to be able to help them improve the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Just because you're paying $80,000 for someone to show up on a conference call once a month and visit you twice a year, if you don't have action and plans behind that expertise, you're going to lose the client. So you got to make sure you can back up what you're teaching. Mm -hmm. Amen. I like that. So the the insurance companies they call us the consultants, and I'm like, we're not consultants, guys. <laughs> All right. So um, the dental practice management consultants, we are not that. Like we stay in our lane. Um, I see two things happening right now that I'd like to get your thoughts on. All right. Mm-hmm. Number one, I see organizations and or consultants or firms where they want to be all things to all people. Right. And mm-hmm. so I'm like. I'm really good at my one thing. I do not know anything about treatment plan. What you just said about the schedule, I would have never had known that, nor would I, am I ever going to point that out to somebody again in right. the future? Cause that's not my, I don't have any experience. I'm be like, well, Lois Banter told me that that's the only backup I've got. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's good backup. Don't get me wrong, but that's not my wheelhouse. So I stay in my swim lane. What I've seen, I see some other, businesses and there's a lot of them especially kind of more f- almost fly by night so they just feel like everybody's jumping out of the bushes and they're like we're building verification plus this ppo negotiation and consult this practice management consult this scheduling hygiene blah 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 and i'm like <laughs> how do you fit that all on a business card and how do yeah. you possibly have all of that knowledge in your in your head so i've, I've never well no wait i i correct myself the first couple of years i owned my consulting company i tried to be all things to all people Wow. And I failed miserably because you can know a little bit about a lot of things and you're not going to get very far. So I quickly found my lane. And that's what we teach at SCN is we teach people how to find their lane, stay in that lane, and then surround yourself with really smart people who have areas of expertise in what you are not an expert in. So you'll fail if you try to be all things to all people. It's just never a good idea. It's not a good business uh, decision. Amen. Amen. So. Glad you agree with that. I do agree with because I would like to debate that with some of them. Perhaps we should get them on the show. You know, I, I love the consulting firms that are formed where they have areas of expertise built within the design of that company. Mm-hmm. So if your if your specialty is on communication, then that's where we're going to send you is on communication training. Uh, if your specialty is leadership, if your specialty is hygiene, if your spe- specialty is uh, clinical. Right. So you're the dentist or the assistant. Right. We're going to send someone in that area of expertise to your office who can teach that one thing. Mm -hmm. So this is what's communication. What does that mean? So for me, I mean, I know what communication is. Define for me and what I in communication consultant. Communication is that's part 90 percent of my business is communication. And it's 
teaching people how to say things the right way. So not asking yes, no questions, um, really diving into what the patient's true interest is in, in that dentistry, teaching them to want it before you tell them they need it. So that's all about communication. It's about communicating with each other to make sure that the handoff from the clinical team to the administrative team is the right way so that the patient understands and wants that needed dentistry. So communication for me in a nutshell, saying things the right way, how to say what you say. I have been building my brand on that. See, that's fascinating. It's don't ask a yes, no question. If you ask me, do you want it? Do you want a glass of water? And I might say, no, I don't really want to. Do you want to pay your bill today? No, I really don't want to. Do you want to go ahead and make your next appointment? No, I really don't want to. Or let's go ahead and make your next appointment. Uh, let me share with you the different um, financial options you have in our practice for payment. You can pay by this, this, and this. So I say, don't ask yes, no questions. Always offer at least two solutions. So you lead the people down the path to make the decision that's going to be in their best interest, but they feel in control. The actual in control person is the person who's offering the options, but the person who's making the decision is going to feel like they're in control because they get to choose one of those options, but you're only going to offer the options that are in the best interest of that patient. So you're like a Jedi. I like to think I'm a Jedi. That'd be great. Although I've never seen Star Wars, but I could be a Jedi. I like it. I do. I'd like to be a Jedi too, but I don't I think you need a scholarship or something. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, okay. Uh, the other thing that um, we, I've talked with Teresa Duncan and with uh, Hutan Shahidi and with several other people I respect in nationally. Uh, and, you know, just like credentialing has always been a problem. The, this has always been kind of an issue, um, but it's gotten worse. Um, and that is the lack of training, I guess, in really technical expertise when it comes to insurance and or billing, right? So if yes. I had a dollar for every time, you know, somebody's like, well, I've been doing insurance for 20 years, Pat. And I'm like, yeah, I've been mm-hmm. driving a car for 20 years too. <laughs> Doesn't mean I can pull the transmission out and put it back in. Right. Yeah. So I have an insurance license. Do you? Right. No. Uh, I'm certified <laughs> in dental benefits administration. And I can design plans. Can you? No. no. <laughs> right. Um, and so, and it's not about me, but it's, it's, it's the, because the docs and the owners of the business aren't knowledgeable enough. Right. To, if somebody tell, you know, if somebody came in and said, Hey, I'm an IT expert, I, I it's not my, my wheelhouse. Right. You know, I have to, Go find the smartest guy, Minicozy. Um, and then I find somebody that I trust, but I know, but you, it's, you have to vet that out. So there are some really good, now don't get me wrong, there's some really, really, really good practice managers out there. And there's some really good insurance coordinators out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that there's less than a certain length of clients, you know, sometimes they're like, oh, it's just, this person knows what they're doing. That on top, so that's always been kind of an issue. And I'm not, you know, and God bless all the all-star practice managers. And I know everybody's trying their best, so I'm not knocking you. Um, there seems to be a turnover problem and an overall lack of ability. There's just not enough people to work. Mm. So turnover has created mm. this huge issue and it's, it's making my hair gray. And COVID didn't help. And the stimulus money did not help. They made more money staying home than working in a dental office. And so dentistry, especially for the administrative and hygiene department, is a very hard to find good teams right now, especially knowledgeable teams. So you're going to hire – you're going you're a dentist, and you're going to take the path of least resistance. You're going to hire the warm body. And mm-hmm. it, you need to have a little bit more in your tank than just being the face that someone sees when they walk through the door. So there's a, there's a serious shortage of knowledge – and a shortage of training how to do it right. Mm-hmm. And, and as a consultant, I see that every single time I go into a dental practice. Is So what is your role in this dental office? Front desk. Hmm. I'm sorry, front desk is a thing. <laughs> That's not a person. <laughs> I'm a front desk. No, you're not. You're a person. So 
it it starts with take is having respect for for the job that you've been hired to do, and then having the wherewithal and the desire to get training on how to do that job right. So on the insurance side, I teach people how to write a great narrative, how to how to use evidence based um, documentation methods to send the right documentation and images in order to get that claim processed the first time rather than 12 times later. So that's where I am on the insurance side on in my profession mm-hmm. is I teach people, dental professionals, how to send a clean claim first so that you don't make all those mistakes. And it costs a ton of money to have to research and redo a claim. Yeah, and it's um, not any fun. It's no fun. And you have to know what are the rules about a buildup? What are the rules about a crown? Why why do some crowns get covered and some not? Well, if you're not good at supplying evidence-based reasons why it was done, then your claim's going to get denied. Mm -hmm. It's logic. To me, that's logic. All right. And, you know, and to be fair to the insurance companies, a lot of times when I'm I'm speaking, everybody gets all torch and, you know, pitchfork on me. I'm like, listen, they're not bad people. They give you all the resources that are in the manual. Did you ever read the manual? Yeah, they no? don't wake up in the morning and say, I think I'm not going to pay a dental claim today. It's, they wake right. up in the morning and they're looking, they're seeking. I've had two clients who have been consultant reviewers at an insurance company. And they say the number one reason a claim doesn't get paid is mm-hmm. because the dental professional didn't supply detailed enough information why the dentistry was done. Dentists are great at documenting what? They're not really good at documenting why. And that, to me, I'm on a mission to make sure that they code the claim correctly, document the claim correctly, write the right narrative, send the right documentation evidence like an interoral photo, and um, then you're going to get the claim processed accurately. All right. So I like this gospel a lot. Documenting the what, but not the why. Mm -hmm. You got to document why. I want... And the legal law supports that. I mean, you're going to go to jail if you didn't do the thing that you documented that you said you did or that you you left something off the documentation. Like we saw a patient on emergency. You got to document that you performed a problem-focused exam in order to send a claim. In order to, in order to say it was a legal document, you're required by law to document that you showed evidence that an exam took place before you rendered dentistry. It's wow. for, for me – don't even get me started. I get no, on a I big old soapbox uh, about yeah, that. It, because the thing that ticks me off the most is thinking that it doesn't matter. That makes me the most mad, is thinking it doesn't matter because it really does matter. I'm with you. Right. So in jail, doesn't... yeah. It doesn't, Nobody looks good in stripes and orange in jail. So I mean, listen, it, it doesn't sound fun to me. John Ray's been to jail a few times. John Ray... <laughs> He seems to like it. I mean, he's probably made some friends over there. He's like, they give me a ham sandwich or something. They feed you three squares a meal or three squares a day. So, is that the bad. deal? You all right? Two squares? All right. Do you sell the other one for smokes or something? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so jail, that sounds bad. It's very bad. And if you go to jail, then you don't have a license, right? Yeah. And so then if you don't have a license. You can't practice the profession. Now you have all that debt. Or vote and, ever again. And so, and make a difference there, right? And so, then you are uh, a pariah, mm-hmm. and you have no ability to support yourself or your family. And so, that's not sound like a path. Is that worth taking a shortcut? And that's and that's what I was talking about the misinformation that's out there. Like it doesn't matter. You know, we're going to write anything we want to on the claim. It doesn't really matter. We're just going to write what what we think will get the claim paid. No, you need to write what you actually did. <laughs> that's what's going to get the claim paid. Right. And speaking to somebody from the insurance industry, like, uh huh. Yeah. Right. And yeah, it is the number one reason, in my opinion, and I've never worked at an insurance company that claims don't get paid, that don't get approved are because it's not enough supporting information in the why department. It's not because they're trying to rip off everybody. No, no. OK, well, thanks. <laughs> All of my insurance company colleagues that are listening to the show. <laughs> hi. Um, see, I'm not I'm I'm neutral. No, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. The insurance industry has frustrated me for years, but not because the insurance companies are crooked. It's, it's usually because the beer, the, it's a large bureaucracy. It and, is. And it's corporation, but it's um, more, it's more accidental ineptness than it is. Um, yeah. Intentional. Right. It's, it's doing the wrong thing, documenting the wrong thing, leaving important information off. I counsel a ton of dentists on, well, my claim doesn't, why don't, why don't my buildups get covered? Well, if you do a buildup, every single crown, you're going to get red flagged. 
Thank you. Right. But if you document that you showed evidence that more than 50% of the tooth structure was involved and you took photographic evidence, there's your proof. Now you're not going to get a denial most likely because you're documenting and showing evidence. Mm -hmm. That's the secret listeners show evidence. Mm -hmm. And they can pull your claims history by the way. And so if you put a crown build up every single time, all right, Uh, that's a, that's a red flag. I still say we sometimes because you have to forgive me. We, the insurance companies, (laughs) um, uh, we can pull that data just like that. Uh, We can also tell how, what, what's the ratio of simple to surgical extraction. So we can also tell all this stuff and then we can compare it to empirical data and determine whether it's outside the statistical norm or what the standard deviation is, because that's what we do. Holy cow, you little statistic maniac. Yeah, I'm a total dork. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm a dork in that way as well, because, you know, I'm a snoop when I go into a dental office, just like Teresa Duncan probably does the same thing. We go into the chart records and we I take a look my, at... You, you're telling me I need to be careful that I need to lock my phone with Teresa around? <laughs> nah. I got my eyeball nah. on you, girl. She's very trustworthy. Um, but we look at... What you're documenting, we 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 actually we actually care enough to look at what you're documenting, and when we don't see it, I mean, one of the last slides in my my seminars is how to how to stay out of jail, how to get out of legal malpractice, and I quote the um, American Dental Association's Code of Ethics report, section five point B point five, um, that lists all the things that will send your behind to jail. We should link to that on the episode page. I like that for sure. That I mean, I and I. Um, I talk about it in every single seminar I give that has anything to do with the financial end of running a business. Section 5.B.5 of the ADA's Code of Ethics will scare you straight. It basically says what constitutes insurance fraud. The minute that claim gets sent, that's not the FBI that's going to come looking. That's the United States Postal Services Investigative Unit that's going to come looking and knocking on your door. Like the... I have to be honest, this sounds super scary to me. I'm like, it's po- pretty scary. The postal service SWAT team's going to come get yeah, me. Yeah, I'm pretty bad. Um, <laughs> you know, so. Hey, also, so, respect to you guys. I'm sure you carry guns um, <laughs> and stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the best tips that I can ever give for documenting evidence of w- the why isn't the written word, it's to take a pre prep and a post prep photo, integral image. You take a pre-prep and then post-prep prep photo, you're showing evidence. And then you take the little periodontal uh, uh, probe that has millimeters written right on the probe, mm-hmm. and you measure that against the tooth. There's your proof. There's your why. Mm-hmm. Photographic evidence proves the why. All right. Imperio, by the way, the most abused code um, from a fraud perspective. For sure. I explain this to clients all the time. So you really need to, uh, as much as you can do, all right. And again, they can pull up history of mm-hmm. how it is. So if everybody who walks into your practice, everybody needs periodontal scaling and root planning, every single person. Um, yeah. Really? Yeah. You know, and the, and the best defense there is to have a really good written periodontal protocol in your office. And that means that you're classifying conditions in a periodontal way. Mm-hmm. So, you know, type one, they're not going to need scaling and root planning, right? That's, they might have a bunch of calculus and, in ANUG, which is like code for really messy gums, yuck, but yuck maybe, mouth. yeah, yuck yuck pre- yuck pregnancy mouth. gingivitis, also an um, important thing to document, but I've it never does, had that. doesn't necessarily, well, thank goodness for that. Otherwise you'd be a he, she. So um, you, you photographic evidence or, or measuring the gums. You can't even do a proper comprehensive oral exam. If somebody's got a lot of calculus in the way, because you're not going to get good pocket measurements. Right. So, this, so it's, this it's just is that like knowledge. So that this, somebody hasn't seen the dentist since like the Reagan administration. Right. right? Somebody right. like John Ray over here. And if you documented exactly the circumstances that caused you to, to code it as a, you know, a gross debridement and you show evidence of that. That's going to get that claim process. But if you say four quadrants of scaling and rippling and you haven't done periodontal pocket measurements yet, well, then you're. You're not you're not forming a legal claim yet. Right. I'm not clinical. What I was I chaired a group. I was in, on the grievance committee, and I can tell you, like <laughs> I I've seen this come in uh, uh, more times than I could count. So but, that's what we we teach. That a good consultant's going to teach God them to recognize awesome. when it's a true periodontal condition. Gotcha. And there are perio codes that aren't perio scaling and replaning codes. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't know why the Council on Dental Benefits coded them as a perio code. Um, it's a, it's not a, it's not scaling and replaning. It's maybe it's gingival inflammation. So, 
Um, I think it's worthy of a really good written detailed narrative when you're coding something that might get kicked out. Make sure you know the why you did it. Make sure you've documented and shown all the evidence of why Mm -hmm. before you code that claim. Is there any resources that you would like to share with the listeners here that are practice owners, docs, um, practice managers, et cetera? Um, Go ahead. Dr. Roy Shelburne is, is, he's my go-to resource. He and Teresa Duncan are my go-to resources for uh, documenting and coding things correctly. Dr. Roy Shelburne, by his own admission, you can go to his website and look at his story. He went to prison for two years. Does he know, John, you know, you know him, John Roy? Yeah, oh, he's, okay. uh, and he turned that lemon and made mint lemonade, and he now lectures on the topic all over the country. Yeah. Dr. Charles Blair wrote Coding with Confidence. Yeah. I helped him write that very first one um, because I know a lot about codes, but I am not a dentist. <laughs> right, so, I'm not right? a clinician. <laughs> I'm not a clinician, but I know I knew enough about coding and documenting, et cetera. Well, Dr. Roy Shelburne has written a lot of articles and helped uh, Dr. Charles Blair um, many times with those coding um being coding things legally the correct way. He's my go-to resource when I have a question about, Hey, is this the right code for this? I mean, you know, 500 diff- different implant codes and the different, mm-hmm. you know, there's so many different ways to code that. That's where I point to people too. Yeah. Okay, so shout out to Charles so, Blair. Yeah. And, shout out to Charles Blair. And North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, I was like, I've told him, I'm like, listen, I did, I, you, I was like, you probably have no idea, but I, I tell everybody because we're, I'm like, we're not clinical. Nobody on my team, right? Yeah. We're all insurance, finance, scanning. This, we're numbers geeks. That's what we do. Um, and it, I'm, they're like, well, which code? I'm like, you're the clinician, bud. Not me. Yeah. All right. You don't, if you don't know, you, yeah. you should just go to practice. And it should boosters. never be the insurance company's position to tell you what code to use. You have to look into your own chart record and your own patient's diagnosis and treatment plan and code the right thing for the right procedure. There's no, there's no, uh, trick, <laughs> right? There's no, well, if you code this, if you code that, and I hear that a lot with insurance companies, well, the insurance company changed the code. No, they gave you an alternate benefit based on the design of the plan that the employer wrote. Oh, by the way, and paid money for that premium. The insurance company is doing what the employer instructed them to do in the design of the benefit. And then they are required to follow legal guidelines in how to process a correct claim. So they're not the bad guys. Are they frustrating? Absolutely. Absolutely. But if you do the right thing and you document it the right way and you write the right narrative and you re- use the right code, you're not going to be as frustrated. Mm-hmm. So. This is the one thing I explain probably every day too. I go, look, plan design is not like Baskin Robbins with 32 flavors. Right. That would be really easy. <laughs> there <laughs> is quite literally tens of thousands of plan designs That's within right. the same company. Right. Right. Within the same yes. company. Because if, you know, when you're selling large group benefits, which is, I've, I've done, I've personally done this. And so you go in there and you go, well, what do you want? Yes. Right. And so right. I can design anything, any which way you want. You can have a $10,000 maximum sure. with no deductible, but your premium is going to be this. Right. Right. So and, uh, employers make business decisions, just like insurance companies make business decisions. If you, if the patient's going to be mad at the design of their plan, don't go be mad at the insurance company, be mad at the employer who wrote the plan. Right. Or their, their benefits consultant or their benefits broker. Um, right. Right. And so that's in the insurance company. So there's, it's a, that's how things get designed. This is actually what I used to love doing it for. And I still dork out on it quite a bit with some of my old colleagues. In fact, <laughs> um, quick plug selfishly, the Georgia association of health underwriters is going to be in Gwinnett County at the Marriott go check out Gahoo doc dot org but i will be moderating a panel of experts from mm. the payer world on uh, what's new and exciting in the world of dental insurance so if you're a broker don't get bor'd over the dental buddy um <laughs> come to the session and check it out oh that's uh, cool yeah so it's fun so i walk in both worlds yes. and so it's it, it's an interesting dynamic for me because there's it, it's like speaking two different languages sure okay. but but it really keeps you informed Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, okay. for sure. I mean, that's I, the way I see it is that you know we're purveyors of intellectual capital. Yes, right. Oh, that's a good. Oh, that's really good. I'm going to write that one down. You can appropriate it if you want. Purveyors of intellectual capital. All right, and we're just trying to spread the gospel and knowledge. And if we know the right way to do things, we need to do that. And then we need to bring other smart people like you, Lois, <laughs> uh, to help us understand. I've learned so much already today. Um, Fantastic. Yeah. This has been great. How? Um, and so, 
Lois, is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners who are quite buried all over the country? Thank you all for listening. If you like the show, please hit the like button and send me a note and tell me how much you like it. Uh, you can find me at P. O'Rourke at practicequotient.com. If you want to be on the show, don't call me. Call John Ray at jray uh, at n- businessradiox.com. Um, <clears throat> Folks do call me and they're like, we want to be, they're public relations people call me. I'm like, hey, you got to talk to John. <laughs> All right. John's actually not a rube like I make him sound out to be. He's an awesome dude and he's the unofficial mayor of North Fulton. So shout out to John Ray. I love you, man. Um, 10 feet tall and bulletproof. I like that about Lois Banta. That's Lo- true. Yes. So Lois, give us out with what you've learned lately. Any shouts out? Thoughts, anything you want to share with all the fine folks out there that are listening right now? Well, just to have an awareness that if you're thinking of getting into the profession of consulting, speaking, writing in uh, in your industry, know that there's a village out there ready to support you. And that's um, SCN. When is the next meeting? Our next meeting is June 11th through the uh, 13th, 2022 in Tiger, um, Tiger, Oregon at an embassy suites out there. And then, um, you know, joining SCN gets you one-on-one uh, access to me personally right up until the conference. So I do one-on-one coaching. It's included in our um, registration fee. We also have our mid-year meeting coming up in Napa Valley uh, at um, uh, January 15th, January mm. 15th. So if you want information about that, just email me at info at speakingconsultingnetwork.com. Gotcha. So that's info at speakingconsultingnetwork.com. I would like to give a special thank you to all of the Speaking Consulting Network members and for allowing Lois to come on here and creating such a great organization that I think that I may make an appearance time and God willing, um, although I would prefer uh, the East Coast or Midwest. You know, we'd love to see you there. Come on out and do a radio show at our conference. We'd love that. John Ray? John Ray, he's, John. he's game. You're in? Good. He just wants to go because there's we would love wine, that. wine out there. You meet a lot of smart people. I like smart people. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's my deal. Um, and I like people that don't, you know, that are not necessarily in my space. I've learned a lot today. So this has been really wonderful. This has been Fantastic. a great show to me. Um, I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Practice Quotient, PPO Analysis and Negotiation. Uh, if you are a top tier provider and you are not getting top tier compensation from your business partners, i.e. insurance companies, yes, they are your business partners. And yes, you should be evaluating it on both sides. Um, insurance folks, you too. Um and you need a go-between, somebody to stand up for you and to translate. Uh, that's what we do at Practice Quotient. If you would like our CEO, who occasionally has something smart to say, um, wrote top 10 tips to know before um, you go and attempt negotiation, whether you use Practice Quotient or you don't, um, you can email info at practicequotient.com or you can go to their website at www.practicequotient.com mention dental business radio top 10 tips and we will send that to you not if you're an insurance company though (laughs) only if you're from the provider community i'm just kidding i don't care (laughs) carriers if you want some but you need to just call me and ask and i'll hook you up um so if you want me to find me, I'm at P.O. Rook at practicequotient.com or telephone numbers 470-592-1680. I would like to once again thank Lois Banta for coming all the way from Kansas City and spending time in for such a great show. This is awesome. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah, it is absolutely my pleasure. And with that, until next time. <laughs>